Checkpoint by Abstract Spectrum. I killed somebody a month ago. I bet I can tell what you're thinking right now. Oh my goodness gracious! Murderer! You're a psychopath! Well, you aren't wrong. Though, I'd like to point out that not all psychopaths are killers. I just happen to be one of the exceptions. Did you know that one in a hundred people are psychopaths? I mean, I wasn't the only psycho on the train that day. The subways in New York City have really gone to shit ever since the famine hit. Not sure why, though. It's not like we have much time left anyways. Most people have resigned to their homes, spending the last of their days watching reality television, you know, stuffing their face. That's why I like to bike to work. Of course, my alarm didn't go off that day. I couldn't risk being late again. My boss already had it out for me. Most people on the train don't know what personal space is, so I've gotten used to being elbowed and having my toes stepped on. We'd all packed into the last remaining car like a can of sardines, so I'm sure I sustained a few bruises on that ride. One woman, uh, I'll call her Susan, need me pretty hard that day. Watch it, lady! I yelped without thinking. Her brow was furrowed in slight disgust. She gave me the stink eye, but I didn't really mind. Susan turned back around to play Candy Crush on her phone. Those types of people all seem to love mindless games, don't they? I watched intently, as it was the only mildly interesting thing happening immediately in front of me. Just as she was about to clear a level, her screen glitched. She tapped on it repeatedly. Nothing happened. She banged on it harder. Nope. All of a sudden, the whole phone went dark, and in the center of her screen, a small blue triangle appeared. None of the buttons seemed to be working. Susan had no choice but to touch the triangle. The shape disappeared, replaced by a pixelated message. The font looked like an 8-bit video game's end screen. It was hard to see over her shoulder, but I'm sure it said something along the lines of... U.S. Citizen, you have been selected from a group of your peers to be saved from this apocalypse. You will receive a phone call in 20 minutes, in which the operator will read off a set of coordinates. Do not forget your coordinates. Coordinates will not be reassigned. You are to go to the given location within the next 24 hours. If you attempt to record the meetup in any way, your safety will be forfeit. In God we trust. Everybody had known about the checkpoint for a while by then. We call it that because, well, it's sort of a checkpoint in your life. It determined if you were going to be one of the people to be taken by the government to be saved from starvation. This was the first time I'd ever seen the screen myself. It was almost like seeing a unicorn. Susan's head darted in every direction, as if she was frantically searching for an exit. The next stop was about 30 seconds away. The second the doors opened, she flew towards them, shoving her way through the mass of people. She reached the small gap between the platform and the train car, and in a moment of triumph, she turned around to face us. Woo! Fucking who, bitches! I'm getting saved from this hellhole, and you aren't. Have a great Monday, losers. Sayonara! Susan gave a cartoonish wave. Her happy-go-lucky demeanor shifted a moment later. I watched her as she reached down to her feet, trying to untangle her shoelaces. It took me a minute to realize that her laces had gotten stuck on the automatic door. It had sucked them up when she wasn't looking. She screamed for help, but no matter who she pleaded with, nobody moved. It was an odd thing, seeing humanity so close to the brink of extinction. Nobody cares about anything anymore. Her cries echoed through the cement station, but by the time security arrived, it was too late. Please mind the gap. Doors closing in three. Susan tried slipping out of the shoe. It only constricted on her foot tighter and tighter. Two. Her breath was erratic. I could see and hear it from where I stood. Tears trickled down her cheeks, falling silently onto the tracks. One. It was over. The doors clenched shut with a sickening squelch. I was too shocked to be sick. The woman was now split in two, the steel slicing a foot into either of her sides. Thick blood dribbled down the inside of the subway, pooling on the floor. At that moment, the sound of screeching passengers didn't even faze me. I prayed to God that that would be my last brush with the checkpoint. And it was far from it. After calling off sick from work, I walked back to my shitty fifth floor apartment, taking extra care to stand clear of the elevator. My roommate greeted me and I walked in. He had turned all the lights off, per usual. The stench of sweaty day-old tacos and Doritos was overpowering. I looked at Jeff who sat on the couch against the far wall. He really had let go of himself. When he and I signed the contract together, he was an aspiring film student with hopes and dreams. Now, he was an overweight, greasy slob who sat in the dark watching Gold Rush all day. You're home early. Oh shit, you look terrible. Did something happen? You could say that. 
I hung my coat on our empty rack. Hey, did you hear about the girl in the news? She totally got chopped in half by the subway trying to get out. Crazy bitch. Jeff shook his head incredulously. When are people going to learn that our time's up? We should just stay home and enjoy it while it lasts. He shoved five more Cool Ranch chips down his throat. Although I told him that I agreed, that couldn't have been further from the truth. I think that we should strive for life. If we didn't have that, what do we have? Nothing. Jeff would never see that. He was an idiot, no matter how ambitious. He once bought a salad for $5 thinking it was weed. I almost envied him, though. People as stupid as him never have to weigh the consequences of their actions. They just have to live with them. Anything interesting happening on Gold Rush? I feigned interest. Nah, these morons always go batshit over every ounce of gold. I swear, they would sell their souls for two ounces. Probably nothing but- Jeff's abrupt silence sparked my curiosity. He was staring down at his phone. He didn't even have to say anything. I already knew what had happened. Bates! 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 Look! He shoved his germy phone in my face. On the screen, the blue message was displayed clearly. For clarification, my name is not Bates. It was a nickname he gave me after Norman Bates from Psycho. Ironic, I know. My real name is Oscar, though I doubt you care. Checkpoint, baby! Jeff chuckled madly, even going as far to stand up from his seat. He performed a little jig before rushing to his bed, which was about 10 feet from the sofa. In a frenzied state, he tore through his pile of clothes, picking out his best Kmart shirt and an old pair of jeans. What are you doing? Getting my outfit ready. I want to look my best for the Secret Service, right? The Secret Service isn't coming to pick you up. You're probably going to be hauled off to some secret facility somewhere. Doesn't it bother you that they're going to restrict your contact with the outside world? Nope. <sighs> I pinched the ridge of my nose, trying to alleviate some of the stress. This was not my day. He changed quickly in front of me, flashing a sweaty round beer belly and an incredibly hairy chest. I swear, I saw Cheeto dust on his mane of curly hair. I suppressed the urge to gag. In a way, I was almost happy for Jeff. I hadn't seen him so enthusiastic since his horror short was featured in the New York City Amateur Film Festival. My joy was short-lived, though. It turned to confusion as I asked myself something. Why had Jeff been selected to live? Sure, he wasn't a bad guy, but he wasn't Mr. Perfect either. His last shower was three weeks ago? He acted as if he didn't even care to live anymore. Me, on the other hand, I went to work, paid my taxes, contributed to society. Why shouldn't I be allowed to live? The question really started to fuck with me after Jeff left. I spent days alone in the apartment agonizing over what I was doing wrong in life. Was I doing anything wrong? Was Jeff doing something right? What about that girl on the train? I had accepted my mortality long ago, so it wasn't like I feared my death or anything. If I could save myself though, I was going to. I just needed answers. That's why I called my ex, asking her to meet me for coffee the next day. She agreed. I started to carry my phone with me everywhere I went. I wasn't usually much of a technological person, but the whole checkpoint craze had forced me to be. I glanced up from it for a few minutes to look around the Starbucks to see if Becca would arrive. Stupidly, I chewed on the temple of my glasses while I waited. It was a nasty habit. The arms on every pair of my glasses suffered from bite marks and scrapings on the side because of it. Usually I didn't attract too many odd looks. I did today. About 20 minutes after sitting down, the ringing of a bell at the entrance door caught my attention. I turned to face the door, where a tall woman with voluminous strawberry blonde hair stood. She removed her leopard print sunglasses and made her way to my table. Becca! Long time no see! I stood to hug her, closing her in an awkward embrace. She pulled away almost instantly. Hey, Oscar. I was surprised when you texted me the other day. What's up? Becca scooted her chair in and propped her elbows on the table, cradling her head with her palms. The apocalypse hadn't gotten to her at all. Her long nails were painted bubblegum pink. Her cherry red lipstick gloss perfectly outlined her pouty lips. If I hadn't known any better, I would say that she was dressed up. Maybe she was even a bit happy to see me. I just thought it would be nice to get together after so many months. Gosh, you haven't changed at all. The problem with being a psychopath is how easy it is to lie. Sometimes I do it compulsively, other times just for fun. We talked about life for a bit, which only ever revolved around her newest clothing line. This season, it was Becca's Best Sales Blitz. 
I imagine she was going for something alliterative. She was never the brightest. After a while, I tried to shift the conversation towards the checkpoint. Becca filled me in on how both her grandparents had been selected. Her grandparents? Are you freaking kidding me? They're like 80. They're gonna die soon anyways. Wow, that's great. I even added with a smile to enhance my performance. Great? I'm never gonna see them again. My Nana hasn't even returned any of my calls. Yeah, I don't think they allow phones in, wherever they are. You know, too risky. Like, what if they found out where they were and text everyone? Becca nodded, frowning. She knew I was right. Her phone buzzed, drawing her gaze to the screen. Sorry, it's my mom. Just hold on one second. She swiped up on her screen, unlocking it with her face. I always found it so creepy how phones could do that. Why would I want to scan my face when a password works just fine? Yeah, Mom? I'm out with a friend right now. What? I can't hear you. You're breaking up. Hello? She repeatedly Hello? called into the phone, presumably to Hello? no response. That's weird. The call just cut out. Not again. Becca dropped her phone onto the counter, yanking her hands away from it as if it carried some sort of disease. Once again, I already knew. Checkpoint. Her mouth dropped open, but no words came out. All she could do was nod. I congratulated her. I... I, I guess I should go now? You know, because they're, they're going to call me. Oh, right, right. Um, good luck. It really was a strange way to end a get-together. But I really had no other choice. I was about to lose my shit in the middle of a dumbass Starbucks. This was the third person around me this week to hit the checkpoint. It was like getting picked last on the basketball team. Instead of humiliation, though, you're doomed to starve to death. Becca scurried out of the shop, eagerly awaiting her phone call. I headed back to my now empty apartment, ready to conduct some research. The whiskey was kicking my ass. Holy crap. I just nursed a glass of Jack Daniels to take the edge off, but an hour later, it feels as if I've been hit by a small semi-truck. Maybe that's why I had the idea that would ultimately lead me to writing this. There was absolutely zero concrete information on the checkpoint. Anywhere. Sure, there were a couple of theories on Reddit, but nothing I could use to help me get picked. I decided to look into Jeff and Becca's backgrounds, trying to find similarities. You know, if I could figure out why they were selected, maybe I could turn the tides in my favor. A simple Google search revealed nothing. I didn't expect it to. People love their privacy, and I don't blame them. Sadly, I'm not some top-tier hacker who can breach government databases with the push of a button. I had to investigate the old-fashioned way. Because I'm not a loser who likes being tracked, I prefer to stay off of the dark web. Luckily for people like me, there are several services readily available on the surface web that provide you with all of a person's information. All you need is a phone number and 20 bucks. Not a bad price, if I do say so myself. I paid for one of the website's subscriptions and entered Becca's number. It brought up a list of facts about her, unemployed, in debt, no kids, and with no current residents listed. I hadn't even known that she'd lost her studio. After Becca's background check, I typed in Jeff's number. Unemployed, in debt, no kids, with our apartment complex listed. All I gathered was that they were both washouts. Was that what I needed to be? A washout? I chalked it up to being coincidence. After all, they were only two of thousands of people who had been chosen. I decided to sleep on it, which got me nowhere. Why would it? It's not like I dream about solutions to my problems. The next day, I called off work again. I didn't expect my boss to forgive me, but it didn't matter, because I was going to hit that checkpoint, one way or another. I strolled around Central Park, a place with absolutely too many people. Best kind of place to find a recipient of the checkpoint. I sat on a green bench for hours, waiting to see somebody make their proclamation. They almost always did. Just as I was about to give up, I spotted a man across the park. He wore a long green trench coat. His dark mocha hair was curly and short. As he walked down the sidewalk, he looked at his phone casually. Suddenly, he stopped dead in his tracks, his jaw dropping to the ground. That was it, he had hit the checkpoint. Everybody who I had seen do it had the same dumbfounded look on their face. To avoid being seen, I lingered a minute longer, waiting for him to start moving along again. Finally, he rushed across the grass to an intersection. 
He waited patiently at the crosswalk. I stood up, briskly jogging to catch up to him. Poor guy. Never even looked over his shoulder. If he had, he would have seen me. His phone, like all others, had returned to its normal state. He punched in a number in record time, the caller ID displaying, Mom. I listened extra hard in this noisy city. Mom, you're not gonna believe this. I got the checkpoint. I, I know, I know. I'm gonna order some pizza first, and then I'll be right over to say goodbye. See you soon. Love you. He ended the call, shoving his phone back into his pocket. Step one of surviving New York City. Never announce your plans in public. Anyone could be listening. Even creeps like me, though I know you don't want to believe that. Usually, I wouldn't care about this guy's plans, but he had something I needed. I followed close behind. A while later, we reached his complex, a rundown building with faded red bricks and a gray edging. It looked a lot fancier than where I lived. I hung back, watching him go into the lobby. The plan wouldn't work out if he somehow saw me. I gave him 15 minutes to order his pizza. At 33, I budged each button on the box at the doorway. Room 320 let me in. It must have been him. I nodded to the woman behind the counter, who pretended she hadn't seen me. I took the elevator to the fourth floor and knocked on the door with golden letters spelling 320. The man I had been trailing greeted me. He looked puzzled, probably because I didn't have any pizza. Where's Before the he could say anything, I charged into his apartment, tackling him to the ground. He hit the ground with a loud thud. He wasn't incapacitated for long, though. Swiftly, he regained control, flipping me onto the ground. I'm not a very burly dude, but I used to visit the gym fairly often. He seemed to be about 10 pounds lighter than me at the time. I used that to my advantage. He struck me on the side of the head, repeatedly, and in an attempt to block the blows, I raised my arm over my face. That's what they do in boxing movies. And to my surprise, and delight, it worked, allowing me to thrust my head forward. My forehead clunked against his. He clutched his head, stumbling back. I jumped to my feet, towering over him. It was at this moment I made a grave mistake. Without hesitation, I grabbed the lamp behind me. My adrenaline was pumping. All that I could hear was the drumming of my own heart. I raised the base of the lamp and swung it down with all my might. The man was no more. I'll spare you the gory details. In that instant, I realized how stupid I'd been. The lamp fell on the floor, landing on his leg. It shattered into a dozen pieces, and so did I, slumping against the wall. Had I really just killed a man? The answer was yes, unfortunately. Now I had an even bigger mess to clean up. The intro to Immigrant Song brought me back to reality. It was coming from the man's phone. I scrambled over to him, checking each of his pockets until I found it. With blood-soaked hands, I tried to answer the call. Please enter face ID. Now you've got to be thinking, I know where this is going. I'm sure you do. I aimed the camera towards the man's face, pulling him into position. I grabbed fistfuls of his curly hair to get his head into the lens. Thankfully, his eyes were still open, and the nasty bits on his forehead were covered by his hair. I swiped to answer the incoming call. The ID registered as unknown. Hello? hello? My voice shook. I had more adrenaline in my system than I thought. North, 41 degrees, 1 minute, 30.87 seconds. West, 74 degrees, 22 minutes, 26.365 seconds. A robotic voice read off. When it repeated the coordinates, I recorded them in my phone's notes. The call ended. I had finally done it. I breathed the deepest sigh of relief in my adult life. I plugged the numbers into my GPS, which showed a reserve that I often visited. I looked over at the man. I felt a bit of sympathy for him. He didn't know I would brush him like that. Sadly, in the apocalypse, it's kill or be killed. I sprinted to the exact place I should have been, or rather, where the man should have been. No matter, I disposed of his body through the fire escape in a nearby alleyway dumpster. I wouldn't have to worry about that for much longer. A man in a crisp black suit was waiting for me on a bench. George Mars Connell? The name is etched into my brain. I almost feel a sense of pride being the only person who knows what happened to him. Sick, I know. I nodded to the agent and confirmed that I was him. Thankfully, he didn't ask for identification. I had worked so hard for this moment, and it had finally come. It was surreal. 
Out of nowhere, I felt a white hot pain surge down the back of my neck. Now, looking back on it, I think it was a taser. Somebody had probably been following me down the trail. Whatever it was, it knocked me out good. The next thing I knew, I was in a cold, stony cell. I've lived in this dungeon for the past month now, counting every rock, observing the guards' patterns. We receive one meal per day. I've lost most of my body weight. Yesterday, one of the security guards made a fatal mistake. He stuck around after dark. I began to screech like a banshee drawing him over to my cage. When I wouldn't shut up, he opened the door, baton in hand. Luckily I had planned for that. I stood behind the door, waiting for him to walk deeper into my room. He did, and while his back was turned, I hit him in the head with one of the largest stones in my cell. He tumbled to the floor, unconscious. I looted his pockets. His phone, which strangely didn't require a password, hasn't been of much use to me. This damn place doesn't have great reception, so texts and calls don't work too well. That's why I'm leaving this message. Along with his cell phone, I took his baton and gun. Then, I slipped into the hallway. I navigated through the corridors, using the maps posted on each door. The last one, the one leading to the exit, used a passcode. Instead of sitting on my ass trying to figure it out, I headed towards another room. Thank god I didn't pull the handle, because the sound of two voices coming from the other side just barely saved me from my own stupidity. I pressed my ear against the door and listened. Shut down the project. He received information yesterday that the famine won't pass. There simply isn't enough food to go around. And what do you mean by shut down the project? You don't mean that we're gonna kill him, do you? Yep. Take them out, one at a time, tomorrow. Lethal injection is probably the easiest way to go about it. My heart dropped to my stomach. Obviously, we weren't the ones being saved. We were the sacrifices. Even worse, I had, quite literally, killed to be here. I'm writing this on the guard's phone. I know it's hard to find sympathy for a murderer, but please, help me. I just need food. And please, for the love of God, if you see a blue triangle appear on your screen, don't follow it. The checkpoint is final, 